Hello, and welcome to the Inspired Living Podcast with Ellen Broderick. Each week we delve into a conversation with an individual who has found their passion and is pursuing it. This week, my guest is Stephen Cope. Stephen is the longtime scholar in residence at the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and he's the founding director of the Kripalu Institute for Extraordinary Living. He's the author of more than a half a dozen books, including Yoga and the Quest for the True Self, The Great Work of Your Life, and his recently published The Dharma in Difficult Times. Yoga Journal named Stephen one of the most influential thinkers, writers, and teachers on the current American yoga scene. Stephen, welcome, and what an honor to have you here with me today. Thank you, Alan. It's a delight to be with you. Very very nice. So um, I'd like to focus on, um, on the Dharma in difficult times um, sure. in this interview, but I'd like to start by asking you uh, about um, your childhood, uh, who the, um, your upbringing, who mm. were your influencers, and, um, and what was your spiritual life like? Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, I, I grew up in kind of a classic Protestant Midwest family in, in Worcester, Ohio. And um, my father was the dean of the College of Worcester, which is a small liberal arts college, uh, Presbyterian college. And so I grew up in a very much a community setting, right? So we all gathered for church on Sundays at the little, the beautiful Presbyterian church. Uh, we had a magnificent choir and our organist was a guy named R.T. Gore who had helped to introduce Bach into, back into the world in, in the 50s and 60s. Um, and as a kid, I was a sensitive kid and I was always absolutely in love with and overwhelmed with the music of the church, the, the experience of being contained in that beautiful community where my father was an important player. Um, the, 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 the most important influence on my life came out of Worcester, Ohio, and that was the Compton family. So we lived right down the street from this very famous family, Wilson Martindale Compton and Helen Harrington Compton. Um, he had been one of our early ambassadors to the UN. He was president of Washington University. Um, he was, a, it was a very distinguished family. His brother, Arthur Compton, won the Nobel Prize for being part of the Manhattan Project. His other brother was president of MIT for 29 years. And his sister and her husband were president of the University of the Punjab. So it was a, a hugely important American family in the, in the mid 20th century. And I just happened to live down the street from them and became their lawn boy. So for almost 10 years, I was under the wing of this extraordinary family. Uh, and it, it gave me a sense of the bigger world, of what was possible. This was a family that was all about living to the fullest, right? Um, and um, I've written about them in one of my earlier books called Soul Friends. In my book, Soul Friends, I, I looked at Kohut's notion that in order to live fully, we have to create a surround of relationship and certain kinds of relationships that, as he said, evoke, affirm, and sustain who we can be. And so I wrote about Helen Harrington Compton in that book because she was one of my first, what I call noble adversaries. She was a, this beautiful magisterial presence and she was tough, right? So I was the lawn boy. So. She got, to push, she got to push me around quite a bit and I had to learn to push back. And um, so as I remember Worcester, and by the way, in two weeks, I'm going back to Worcester for the 50th reunion of my twin sister and my brother who attended the college there. And I'm very excited about it. Um, I loved growing up there. Of course, I went from there to Amherst College where I was, exposed a whole new world of spirituality, which included Quakerism. And I, I started attending Quaker meeting there and was 
very moved by that. In graduate school later in Boston, I was exposed to Buddhism and that just absolutely lit me up. I, I was exposed to the work of Chogun Trungpa Rinpoche, who was one of the great crazy wisdom gurus. And, you know, it is said that in the 70s, when I was in, um, I was in divinity school at, at um, Episcopal Divinity School, it was said you could, you could meet your guru in Harvard Square. So I did indeed meet my guru in Harvard Square. And it was Chogun Trungpa Rinpoche who had uh, just escaped from Tibet and studied at Oxford and had begun writing his magnificent corpus of books. Um, so that was really the beginning of my exposure to the Eastern contemplative traditions. And when I discovered Buddhism in sitting, I was in graduate school at Boston College and I was so lit up. I was completely lit up by the genius of those traditions. And I started sitting and I started doing yoga and, um, and that's how I ended up at Kripalu finally as uh, 32 years ago um, for just a year long sabbatical, which turned into 32 years and, and more at this point. So that's a very brief sketch of a fairly complicated picture. Yeah. Well, you know, I find it really interesting because your path is not, you know, a straight linear path. You no. really have a lot of twists and turns in your life, yeah. in your life, both spiritually and also just in, in what you've chosen to do. Yeah, it's true. Um, it, it's why I, I don't have an elevator pitch about my life because it had many, many chapters. You know, I had a whole chapter where I was going to be an Episcopal priest and I went to Episcopal Divinity School and because I'm gay, they didn't let me become a priest. So um, there were lots of twists and turns, but what it, 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 it eventuated in a uh, exposure to a lot of spiritual traditions in, in depth, actually. Mm -hmm. And you seem to have also had the ability to, uh, when you've come, when something has come, come across your path that is particularly uh, meaningful or lights you up, you really see it and and um, delve really deeply into it. I do. And I, I, you know, there's a great saying about Indian spirituality and religion, which is they never throw anything away, right? So it's built like an archaeological dig, one level on top of another. And in order to understand it, you have to dig all the way down. So uh, that's kind of my life. It's just a lot of a lot of layers. Yeah, <laughs> and and yet when I think about them, they they um, actually make a lot of sense going from one to another. So it, there was a period after I think you uh, studied uh, for divinity in divinity school where you yeah. probably used some of the things that you had acquired there, but you had a a practice in uh in boston for 10 10 yeah. years or so yeah well i studied psycho I, I studied psychoanalytic psychotherapy um i got an msw clinical social work at bc mm -hmm. and i was totally lit up by that i mean i, I went through a psychoanalysis it was fantastic mm -hmm. and then when i discovered the contemplative traditions I, I realized that they have a depth psychology, which is equally brilliant to the, the discoveries of the West. And in very many areas are congruent, right? Um, I mean, the, the, the one difference is that, you know, Freud used to say, uh, psychoanalysis is to free the patient of neurotic suffering so he can return to ordinary unhappiness. And the... The contemplative traditions were interested precisely in ordinary unhappiness. Mm -hmm. And so that fascinated me. And, and, and those traditions are so intellectually brilliant mm -hmm. uh, as, as the, the psychoanalytic tradition is. So mm -hmm. when I arrived at Kripalu, this wonderful spiritual community, they embraced me with open arms because I had some familiar familiarity with the Western depth psychology tradition and, and now the Eastern tradition. And it made for a rich conversation over there. 
Yeah, I would imagine too that part of that rich conversation is that you could, in a way, uh, folks who are in one tradition or the other don't know the language of the other or didn't. I think now more there there is more crossover, but probably at that point in time you could um, really identify. It would seem to me the areas that um, that were actually quite similar um, in both traditions. Yes, and you know, I mean, I know you've been deeply involved in the analytic tradition, the Western tradition, and um, it's been just through the, the years of my professional life that the Western tradition has begun to embrace the insights of the East, right? Mm -hmm. when, when I was uh, practicing in Boston and had my own practice, I was the, the whole idea of meditation and yoga were very marginal indeed. And now, I mean, you, you have been affiliated with one of the most, um, what should I say, the, a pillar of Western psychoanalytic thinking at, at Riggs. Um, and now it's invaded even the sacred halls of, of Riggs. I don't know if the portraits are shaking off the wall over there, but... <laughs> Um, when they I would, might be. <laughs> but, they might be. They might be. When I was younger, when I was in my 30s, I once applied for a job at, in a very good job at Brigham and Women's in Boston, and I, I didn't get it because I brought up meditation as a as a potential clinical resource. So, over the course of my professional life, the Eastern contemplative traditions have been responsible for the research for the the um the growth of something called positive psychology in, in in the west and it's been a great contribution you know i think that that part of the um uh, impetus that the part of what made that happen um we have a, a friend in common angela wilson who um yes. who came to riggs and was able to um really uh, bring the, uh, the benefits of work. I had been doing there for years, but people didn't really get yeah. the benefit yeah. of, and, and she was able to put the language to it that really allowed a lot of the doctors and, um, and, uh, and other clinical staff to, um, to get it. And at the same time, there were people who, um, uh, who grew up, um, you know, young people who, who grew up with uh, some of these, um, with yoga or with meditation and they, and they bring, so there were doctors who were coming on for whom this was not a new concept. Right. Um, so the combination of having people who could translate, um, uh, uh, there's another woman who's there now, a young woman, a doctor, um, uh, Heather Churchill, who can translate for a lot of the other doctors um, what it is that, um, that could benefit greatly the patients um, in a way that fits into the language that, that they're familiar with and the, and the um, kinds of, um, uh, there's a protection of the space that, um, that, that people want. They wanna make sure that that's not going to be um, disturbed in any way. And I think that, that you've done a lot in, uh, in the world through these books that you've written um, to bring what has been in the past a pretty foreign um, idea or concept um, of, of a way to live um, and making it really accessible. One of the ways that you've done this is to bring the lives of people we know, people who we're familiar with. We may not know them. They may have lived a hundred or a couple of hundred years ago, but, but we know they, who they are and we know things about their lives. And um, you've taken these lives that are not unfamiliar to us and shown the um, connection to some really potentially um, uh, life-changing concepts. Yeah. 
So I wonder yeah. if you want to speak to that a bit. Yeah, um, I really struggled with how to reach um, a mainstream American audience with some of these um, ideas that are so very practical and useful. And one of the great things about the Eastern contemplative traditions is they were extremely practical and even empirical and scientific. Um, whereas in my experience with Western thought in general, both psychologically and theologically, is that it's, it's very up in the head. Um, and you know, this is one thing Thoreau, I write a lot about Thoreau because Thoreau was very much about, it's, it's all about how you live like living a full human life what the Eastern traditions call the Jiva Mukti or the fully alive human being mm -hmm. is all about how you live in the world. So I wanted, having experienced them myself, I wanted other people to be able to relate to these brilliant concepts, which is how I, I hit upon the idea of using great lives from the West and also ordinary lives from the West to exemplify the, the practices that, that we find in the East. And it was so much fun for me because all you have to do is pick up any autobiography of a great life. And many of these principles are enshrined there. They're just not called Dharma or Moksha or whatever, but there they are, right? Yeah. So all you have to do is scratch the row, you know, and you find the whole thing. So I thought it was uh, one of the things I found so, so fascinating was that some of these people who you um, uh, exemplify in the book mm -hmm. are uh, people who actually had a connection to what I consider to be um, the spine in your book, which is the Bhagavad Gita. Right. Um, and I didn't realize uh, the, the impact that that piece of literature has had on some, you know, remarkable lives so that it's, in some cases, it's a bit of a coincidence. Um, uh, maybe Sojourner Truth probably didn't walk around with a copy of the Bhagavad Gita, right. but, um, uh, but for other people, it was, you know, what they had in their back pocket, what they took to prison with them. Um, I mean, I mean, for one thing, the Gita, which is the most important scripture in the yoga tradition, I can say that clearly, it's known by every villager in India, and almost any temple you, you go to has some inscription about Arjuna and Krishna. Everybody knows this, this tale. Um, so it's a magnificent, short, brilliant scripture, but it wasn't translated into English until I believe 1825, and that's how Thoreau got his hands on it. Emerson gave it to Thoreau and said, dude, you should read this, right? And then Thoreau became absolutely enchanted with it. And then you can follow its influence, starting with Thoreau's great essay on civil disobedience, which was profoundly marked with the, the marks of the Gita, all the way, there's this long trajectory you can follow, which nobody in a book has followed yet, curiously enough, um, all the way to um, Gandhi and Martin Luther King and present day social action. Um, Mandela, you know, who lived half of his life in prison, um, the Danish resistors during the Second World War, Annie Besant, the great theosophist, Sunita Williams, who took it with the, the book with her to um, outer space, to the space station. There's a copy up there, okay? So it's kind of been hiding out in the background as perhaps the second most influential spiritual treatise in, in the West. The first, of course, being the, the Christian Bible, I would say, um, because that also had an influence on that whole trajectory. Um, certainly by the time you got to Gandhi was uh, an extremely pluralistic religious thinker. So he incorporated a, a lot of the Bible, the Sermon on the Mount, but his main scripture was the Bhagavad Gita. And he said, 
if you want to see what a life looks like that's been dedicated to the principles of the Gita, look at my life. So that's a pretty cool life to look at. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Now, when you when how did you come across the Bhagavad Gita, and did you know right away that um, that it would play an important part in your life? I didn't, and and the reason is that most of these scriptures, these ancient treatises that I've spent my career translating and commenting on, um, are not that easy to read. So there's like in, in the Bhagavad Gita, it's really a kind of a dog's dinner of Indian philosophy and, and psychology. And you can't really read that and get much out of it unless you have a guide, unless you have a commentary. And there weren't that many Western commentaries. The, the one that I used that was, that's really brilliant is Eknath Eswaran. And Eswaran was an, a student of Gandhi, an Indian who came to this country taught at Berkeley, I believe, or UCLA, um, Berkeley. Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Berkeley. Um, and translated the Upanishads, the Gita, a lot of great um, what Eastern literature. Um, so he's one of the, the few bridges. So the, the answer to your question is, I didn't, I didn't understand it at first. It's complicated, right? And what I did in my first book on the Gita was to vastly simplify it i think in a good way mm -hmm. and i think in a way that i know has been very useful and the simplification is the four pillars of the gita are discern your dharma which means discern your true calling in this lifetime do it full out this is called the doctrine of unified action bring everything you've got to it so discern your dharma do it full out then third pillar let go of the fruits let go of the outcome. Krishna says to Arjuna in the, in the Gita, um, whether you succeed or fail is none of your business. Your only business is, are you doing your calling in life? And then the last one is, Krishna says to Arjuna, turn the whole thing over to me. In other words, turn it over to God. Turn it over to something bigger than yourself. Be dedicated to something bigger than I, me, and mine. So discernment, unified action, letting go of the fruits, which is a very difficult one for Westerners. And I really have to work that one hard. And turning it over to God is also a little difficult for a lot of people who um, don't believe in God or um, have, have a different idea about what that looks like. Um, but yeah. Yeah, and you can even be, I mean, I, the image that just popped into my, my head is um, you can want to hand it all over to God, but be a little bit like the kid that's standing on the, um, on the uh, diving board, the high diving board, you know, yeah. you want to jump and, you, <laughs> and, 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 and yet it's hard to let go enough to trust that it's going to work out. That's right. It's honestly, um, it's a lifelong process of learning to turn things over. It's perhaps the most important practice I have is, um, is turning things over on a daily basis. And then you take it back sometimes, and then you have to give it back again. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, uh, accepting accepting that is is one of the key parts of the work around um, around living your dharma mm -hmm. learning to accept and let go and um, and when you do you begin to live occasionally not all the time in this experience of flow where I mean I, I do um, my my ideas of God and the divine are very shaped by the Eastern contemplative traditions but I, I do believe in this idea of, of God's will. God's will and the idea of Dharma are very, very similar. Um, it, it's, it's a powerful force. It's a real force. It's not just an idea to which we must align ourselves. Well, not must. We can align ourselves with that power. We get little glimpses of it all the time. We get little intuitions and 
um, and hunches and downright, you know, um, voices in our head. And I'm not talking about the kinds of voices you deal with at Riggs. Um, but the, the experience of aligning with that force, that power, that real power of Dharma, God's will in the world is, uh, it's a great relief when you can actually align with it and let it take you like a river and, and life becomes a flow of, of little miracles all the time. I mean, you know, we don't usually think of it this way, but I, my life is just a flow of little teeny miracles that all add up to whatever the divine wants them to add up to. And I'm quite happy with them. <laughs> I'm sure you know the poet John O'Donohue. Oh, I um, love John. yes. He yes. has um, one of the most wonderful uh, short poems that I have ever come across. And, and I think if I didn't have anything else, I could live, live my life by this one, which is, I would love to live as the river flows, carried by the surprise of its own unfolding. That is just beyond beautiful. And it reminds me of, I write about Robert Frost in my first book. And he, he writes in a poem, a poem lives, he makes this image of a poem like an ice flow that, that lives on its own melting. Mm. Get that, it's like the ice cube that's sitting on a little incline and it melts and as it does, it moves all by itself. Mm -hmm. Um, you see those images all over, all over Frost, letting go, surrendering into the, that higher wisdom that's, that's right there. And Frost was brilliant at doing that. I mean, he, this guy understood at 18 that he wanted to be a poet, but that was not considered a vocation in those days. And so he had to his life is a story of one surrender after another into the vocation of poetry. One letting go of contemporary mores and um, uh, what his family thought and what anybody thought until he discovered his own brilliant voice. But he was widely considered like Thoreau, a kind of ne'er-do-well. He bought this farm in Derry, New Hampshire and didn't farm, he farmed poetry. So um, the farmers all thought he was like just a crank and uh, right, a ne'er-do-well, but no, he was finding his own distant drummer as Thoreau did. So can we go back to you for a minute? Um, sure. and, and, you know, because as you're talking, I'm also thinking about you know, the few things I do know about in, in your life, I don't know maybe too deeply, but that you had a, a career that involved dancing and also uh, one that in, involved uh, uh, piano playing that was on a, a very accomplished level. Um, yeah. And so I, I wonder about um, how, you know, how that voice showed up for you to oh. switch from these other um, paths that could have also led in really interesting directions. Mm -hmm. um, and and what, what that, you know, what that, uh, how it was that you heard the call to, to pivot. Yeah. You know, first of all, I did have a whole career in dance, a very short one, but when I was, in college at Amherst, um, there was a great dance department at Smith and at Mount Holyoke. Amherst was all men in those days. And my girlfriend at Mount Holyoke was a ballet dancer. And I was absolutely riveted to what she did. And I was, I was athletic, I was in good shape. There were no men involved in it at all, but she took me to a, to a, a I almost said yoga, to a ballet class. And teaching the class was um, uh, Agnes was um, Rosalind DeMille, who was the niece of Cecil B. DeMille, wow. and was this gorgeous, beautiful woman who, you know, just to watch her arms flow was a magnificent sight. I was captivated 
And I was the first student at Amherst to get actually get credit for dancing at Smith and Mount Holyoke. I, I don't know where I got, I got the permission somewhere in my family to go for things, even if they weren't um, what my family expected. And they were totally shocked by the dancing thing. That was not what you did coming out of Amherst after we paid for this hugely elite college. But I went to Jacob's Pillow that summer. I was a scholarship student at Jacob's Pillow. I met all, tons of the greats, you know. And Jacob's um, Pillow is a, is a world-renowned dance center that's also in the Berkshires. Right, um, exactly. that, uh, that has had um, some of the most remarkable uh, dancers from around the world from, I think it was formed. By Ted Sean. In the 30s. Yeah. yeah, it was actually formed by Ted Sean and his group of male dancers in the 30s. He had died the year before I got there, but um, his partner was still running the pillow and some of the original male dancers were still there teaching. And, you know, Martha Graham's company was there that summer and the, a lot of the most wonderful ballet companies and I was just enchanted and thrilled. And then I joined a company. One of the companies that came was the Minnesota Dance Theater with the brilliant Lois Holton, who grabbed me up and took me to Minnesota. And I had a whole career with very, only a couple of years. My family was so freaked out by the whole thing. Um, and I was too, to tell you the truth, because the, 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 the career trajectory of, a, of a, a dancer is very short. It's very difficult. It usually involves injury. You get to 35 and you're injured and you're too old. And now what do you do? And I was actually security concerned enough that I thought, I just can't do that. I, I, I can't do that. So that's when I went to seminary because um, the church that I got involved with in Boston when I came home uh, was all about the arts and arts ministry. So I got into, and they had a dance ministry and a music ministry, and I'd already studied the piano for most of my life. So I, I was quite an accomplished pianist. I, I was a good pianist. Um, and my teacher said I could have done it professionally. But again, I, I, I'm not sure I could have lived the lifestyle uh, so a lot of the decision was um, because I, I needed an actual career that I could sustain and that could sustain me well. And I came from this WASP family, you know, we had not one but three people on the Mayflower. Um, and it just was so out of my cultural milieu that... Um, uh, and, and also I had this big spiritual hunger and longing. And so Episcopal Divinity School for me, the, the couple of years I spent there was a haven where I got to make that shift from the arts into uh, the career that I finally chose. Yeah. And that career, you know, ultimately has, uh, has led you to not only sharing your wisdom um, and understanding of yoga, the Bhagavad Gita, the people's um, connections to um, to their inner voice, and um, and and how to uh, listen for, uh, make room for, listen for, and honor, mm -hmm. um, and and act on. Uh, on that voice, so helping helping to guide people in in those ways, but also I think you had had mentioned in um, I think it was in the uh, the Dharma in difficult times that um, the times that you have really felt in the flow have been when you were writing, and yeah. um, so would you speak about that a bit? Yeah, I will. You know, I I, I come from a family of writers. My grandfather. Uh, was a very beautiful patrician man who wrote um, crime thrillers, right? And, the, and kind of nobody knew it, but he had this whole, he was, uh, he had a, a more mainstream career too, but in the background, he's writing crime thrillers for crime magazines. And um, 
my mother, his daughter, became a poet and published a, a number of books of poetry. And um, so writing was very much in my in my blood and it connected me to my grandfather, Oliver Frisbee Crothers, with whom I was very close and my mother. Um, and I, I, I somehow weirdly, I always knew that I would write. I always knew that I would write books. So when I was at Kripalu for five years, we, um, for, for your viewers who, who don't know, Kripalu is, as I think you said, the largest yoga retreat center in America where we see 40 or 50,000 people a year in programs ranging from yoga to meditation to, to personal growth. Um, and um, we, early on when I arrived there, we actually had a, a very famous Indian guru who was leading the community. And he had the requisite um, inevitable, apparently fall from grace. Uh, and there were a few years there where the community really was disorganized and fell apart. I stayed, but it allowed me to write my first book, which was really an assessment of what had happened in that community. It's called Yoga and the Quest for the True Self. Mm -hmm. And so in it, I explore the, the trap of projection that Eastern teachers and gurus find themselves in, where the students, in America, longing for this exotic, all-knowing, all-powerful being, begin to project that onto one of these teachers who unwarily comes over from the East. And then if the teacher begins to buy into those projections, we have a, a serious model um, because it develops in the way it did at Kripalu, where it develops an air of unreality and um, uh, the students become more subject to the kind of magical thinking about who this person is. In this case, his name was Amrit Desai. Um, he got caught up in it. And um, it's just a very interesting psychological dilemma that I, dis that I explored in that first book. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I used the writing of the book, which took me four years to come to grips with what had just happened to me. I just made this huge leap into this brilliant spiritual community and was in it with both feet and it exploded. Why, how, how did I get there? What did that mean? What did it mean? What did it say about the West, about the East? And so I, I, I chunked that off as my topic and it, it became a, a bestseller in, um, and, and still is actually. So that was my first writing experience and it was so successful. I was, I, I was caught, I was hooked. I'm, and I will be for the rest of my life. I just love to write. I love to take complex things and make them and sort them out. Mm -hmm. Now, when uh, I don't remember if it was um, in the book, The Dharma in Difficult Times, or if I read it as I was preparing for this um, in some other, with some other source, but um, mm -hmm. where you said that you were actually in the, you had started to write something different, um, or at least the focus wasn't exactly right. And then the state of the world um, really facilitated the putting away of many of those chapters, yeah. putting them in a drawer. Can you speak about that? And Yeah, this is what happens when you uh, follow that still small voice, that call of Dharma. Mm -hmm. And I, I had begun the, the book before COVID, I had, a, I had had an experience, a difficult experience in relationship to one of the many institutions that I'm involved with. And I decided to, to look at how the Gita and the Dharma um, approaches those very, very difficult dilemmas that we get ourselves into or the world gets us into. Um, and the book was pretty much done. And when COVID happened, 
And the world completely broke open as a result of COVID. And one of the things that came out, of course, was, was the mask that we put over uh, racism and social injustice and who, who really were the, um, uh, the, the workers that we absolutely needed. What, what, what was the word, the essential workers? Who were the essential workers? Well, we found out a tremendous amount about what we've been masking in this culture, who we are. We had the great resignation where, where 43% of people left their job because they weren't happy or satisfied. And my book was done in the spring of 2021, I believe. I'm, I'm losing the chronology a bit. And my editor and I and my agent looked at it and said, no, you cannot. This, this book was written for a, a paradigm, a set of dilemmas that existed before, but it doesn't speak to now. And so one of the things was it was full of uh, privileged white men, right? And it was really interesting. For example, I had a whole section on Rachmaninoff, mm -hmm. who was, of course, a, a Russian aristocrat. I had a section on Jean-Pierre de Cassade, who was a great 17th century Je Jesuit. Mm -hmm. I had a whole chapter on Darwin. I had a chapter on um, uh, the great founder of the Jesuits. Um, and uh, I had to... I had to say, wait, the, the times is calling for something else. So Steve, look at, and, and, and so I added in Thoreau and Sojourner Truth and Marian Anderson. And I, I ended up writing this book that I, I swear to God, I did not write this book. This book just got written through me, but it takes the Gita and follows its effect on xenophobia and racism all the way from Thoreau, who wrote civil, on civil disobedience because of his feelings about racism, all the way to the present time. And um, uh, it's not what I thought I was doing at all. It just happened. You know, another really interesting part of what you're saying is um, is how the uh, the part is is uh, is a bit of the whole as well, and yeah. vice versa. So you know the fact that you had written about all men um, yeah. shows where that 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 societal piece actually you know lives within right. the individual as well. Absolutely. And 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 and, and the, the looking at the. Um, uh, like the difficult look at the parts that are hard to see because they're not pretty mm -hmm. um, and not complimentary um, is something that that also can allow us to 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 move beyond that that but if we don't have the courage to look at that and and to see it kind of head on um then then we are in a way imprisoned within it um you said something very important there ellen the part is in the whole and the whole is in the part that's the very central essence of the bhagavad gita mm -hmm. the notion that you know I, I tell the great ancient tale of indra's web in the book uh, Indra was the great god of, of the Vedic pantheon, which existed thousands of years ago. And, and, it, and he lived on this mountain, Mount Miru. And it was said that Indra had cast a vast net over the entire universe. And that at the warp and woof strand, at the apex of each warp and woof strand, at the vertex rather, is a gem. And that gem is an individual soul. And it's that individual soul's job to hold together that part of the net. So our dharma is us holding together our part of the net. It doesn't have to be big or grandiose. It's just what's happening in our world that we feel called to contribute to. And in that way, the, um, the individual fulfillment and the common good arise together 
And this is a very central notion in the Gita that I love and that we need to recapture. This is one of the reasons I wrote the book as I, as I did. We need to recapture that idea that there's a connection between the fulfillment of my own personality and my own self and the common good. So believing that there was no way I could write a book that spoke to the last century. I had to listen to the call of, um, of now, what's being called for now. And, and I did, and I'm very happy. It, it led to this profound sense of fulfillment on my part. And I hope to the common good, because I'm, I'm trying to push this book out to all the yoga studios in America. And, and one of the reasons there is that the yoga community has, has, has often been in America a little bit interned, a little bit narcissistic, a little bit about I, me, and mine, my perfect body, my perfect health. Um, and it's time now that we, that we get the other side of this two-winged bird, the common good. So, and, and, and the paradox is, and the beauty is that they're combined. They're absolutely combined. And you, you had said uh, many times in, in the book, a, a, a deed well done, a, um, I think it was, uh, what is well done will, can never be undone. Exactly. So that's a Thoreau quote. So Thoreau says, no matter how small the beginning, what is done well is done forever. I absolutely love that. And I totally believe it. There is a mystical quality to if, when you find your dharma and you're doing it fully, you, you don't really know what its purpose is in the larger scheme of things. We live in a big tapestry and we don't get to see the whole tapestry. But even if you think, let's say your dharma is stamp collecting, even if you think that that is not serving the common good somehow, if you're doing fully your stamp collecting or your stamp creating, it has a mystic effect on the whole. Just you're doing your dharma, right? Yeah, and we're, we're gonna need to end, but I just wanna pull that together too with, it, it, it seems to not only uh, reach out, and I, I believe it was somewhere where you said, it, it, one act well done can change the world. That's right. Um, and, um, and it reaches across time, which I think was very apparent in this book too, that, that an act that Thoreau did, uh, you know, led to a, a full civil disobedience over hundreds of years. Exactly. Uh, Thoreau, Thoreau took on that question, well, we won't get into this, but he spent a night in jail. So he took on the question of civil disobedience and he worked it really hard for a year and a half mm -hmm. until he had a statement about it. And his statement was precisely, um, if you're following your Dharma and, and your Dharma is well done, it's done forever. It, it transcends time. Mm -hmm. The Greeks called this kairos, which are, there's, there are two forms of time in, in the Greek. Um, way of thinking about it. One is, is, uh, uh, one is ordinary um, tick-tock, tick-tock, moving forward linear time. And that's called chronos. And the other is kairos, which means vertical time. Mm -hmm. And when you're living in your dharma, you're living in vertical time. Yeah. You're connected through your idiosyncrasy to the universality mm -hmm. of the whole. Yeah. Beautiful. And, and, and let's just end with, would you tell, um, to tell the listeners about, um, you are going to be um, giving a, I think, is, it, is part of it in person? And then there's another one that's online, but um, where you explore, uh, I think it's through Kripalu. Yes. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about that? And if people are interested, how they could become, um, you know, how, how they could sign up? Yeah, no, I'm glad to. I, I'm teaching now both online and in person. Um, and my next online program is coming up. It begins on June 16th and it's online for two hour sessions uh, 
four Thursdays in a row from the middle of June to the middle of July. It's through the platform of Propalu. So if you're interested, simply go to, you can either go to my website, which is stephencope.com, or you can go to Kripalu, which is kripalu.org, and search for me, Stephen Cope, and it will lead you to all the links to sign up for this online program. Um, and then I have a lot of programs. They're all on my website coming up over the course of the year. Some of them are in person at Kripalu. I have a wonderful five-day retreat in August at Kripalu, which we do every year, and I love it because it allows people to really go deep and get up there on the mountain and, and dive in. Uh, I have a loving kindness retreat coming up in the fall, hopefully with Sharon Salzberg again, with whom I usually teach. So it's all there online. Wonderful. Well, Stephen, this has been such a delight. And oh, um, the delight is all I, mine. It's all mine, Ellen. And I, I love having met you. I think we're going to become friends because you've got a beautiful vibe. Thank you so much, and and that would that would be um, you know ter terribly uh, wonderful uh, uh, thing to follow up with and and have tea together. We're gonna have tea together, Kripalu, and everybody else come to Kripalu and have tea with me. <laughs> Thank you so much, both for this interview and for the work, because I think it's a work well done. Thank you for thank you for seeing it. I really appreciate it, and and so much fun to talk with you, Ellen. Great. And okay. for the Inspired Living podcast, thank you all for joining us and join us next week as well. Um, when next week, our guest will be Ann Alter, who runs a um, center, a uh, online presence for selling products that are very earth conscious. And we'll learn about her journey as well. Thank you all. Okay.